Today is going to be the training for our instructors. We're going to go through this slide by slide, and we're going to teach you how to do this. So you can take this notebook with you when you go, and you can train a group of people with disabilities. Okay? Okay. But if you want some help, sometimes we can help you. Microphone on and do I need to be holding it or it's on? Um, just whoever's speaking, just kind of hold it up like she's holding it now. Yeah, okay. And you don't have to have it at all times. If she's holding, that's cool. <laughs> It'll pick you up. Just, just kind of keep it pointed. You can bring it out. Yeah, that's okay. fine. Perfect. All right, in your notebook, you're going to write down everything that you
we know that there are often times when you don't have 90 minutes. I mean, it happens to me all the time. Well, I can't give you 90 minutes, so it takes 45, <laughs> you know? So it's designed to be 90, but it's also been made in such a way that, the, that, we, that you can take some of the slides out of it. And we will tell you which ones of those slides you can take out and, you know, that you can skip. And you can actually probably get it down to 45. I would not go any lower than 45 because the information is just too vitally important, okay? And sometimes if you had somebody that said, hey, I'll give you 15 minutes, you might be able to go and simply say, I can provide this training for your group in a longer period of time if you would like me to. You know, you could sort of, that 15 minutes might be an advertisement. Mm -hmm. Exactly, right, exactly, okay. All right, there's a couple of perspectives in Mississippi that y'all need to remember. And I'm going to venture to say that a lot, some of y'all aren't going to be aware of this. Environmental perspectives. There's one state in the country, and it's Mississippi, that can be impacted by tornadoes, hurricanes, and earthquakes. And it's Mississippi. Tornadoes, hurricanes, and earthquakes. We have Gulf Coast. Actually, we have more tornadoes every year than the majority of other states. This, the, that whole tornado alley business up there in the Midwest is what Mississippi and Louisiana and Alabama are tornado alley these days, okay? So we've had more tornadoes lately than the majority of states. And then we sit directly under the New Madrid seismic fault line. If the New Madrid seismic fault line if there's an earthquake on that fault line, which is up near St. Louis, we're going to be impacted here in Mississippi significantly. Maybe not as significantly as Missouri and Tennessee, but absolutely we will be impacted a lot. And when you think about it, we've got some large lakes in the state, Sardis Lake, I think, and uh, Arkabutla up in North Mississippi. Some of these have earthen dams. So an earthquake is going to rupture that dam and a lot of water is going to come through, okay? So tornadoes, hurricanes, and earthquakes are one of the few states that can be affected by all three, or the only state, really, that can be affected by all three, okay? Uh, we have bad weather here. We have severe weather. We have tornadoes, lightning, thunderstorms. Um, and then in addition to that, that's environmental, but we also have a, uh, the Grand Gulf Nuclear Station down in Claiborne County. And if something happens at Grand Gulf, that, that might be considered less environmental than man-made, but it's, radio, it's, it's radiation. <laughs> so it, it could be a real problem, okay? Until I started <laughs> with FEMA, I did not know how many things I needed to worry about. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. okay. All right, and then the other perspective, and these are things that we want y'all to be aware of if you're gonna go out and train people. We want you to be able to tell people this is the issue here in Mississippi, you know, okay? All right, the disability perspective. There are so many different surveys out there that, that count the numbers of people with disabilities that you can go with any one of them. The bottom line is that the two that are most used from the Centers for Disease Control and the American Survey, the, fact, the American Fact Finder Survey, which is the census essentially, and then the one from the Centers for Disease Control, the bottom line is that about 29% of our state's population indicate that they have a disability. 29%. That's needless to say the highest rate of people with disabilities per capita in any other state in the country. Okay? So that's the other reason. So now we have, we're affected by all these, all these uh, environmental issues and Grand Gulf, and on top of that, we got more people in the state with disabilities than any other per capita, right? Okay. So that's, a, and then the historical perspective that you need to be aware of. Hurricane Katrina. I mean, is that history enough? How many of you in here don't, were not living here or don't recall Hurricane Katrina? How many of you in here were directly affected by Hurricane Katrina? See, right. We all were, right? Everybody in the state of Mississippi was somehow directly affected. Some people more than others. I know we've got some Gulf Coast uh, residents that are here today in this training. Directly affected. That's our historical perspective. And here's the thing. 
Lots of people were directly affected by Hurricane Katrina, but we've also had we also had Hurricane Camille in '69. The two most talked about hurricanes in the country hit Mississippi, right? And then the other issue too is Candlestick Park tornado, the Louisville to tornado that took out an entire hospital and a nursing home in Louisville, Mississippi. Okay. Um, there was another tornado the year after that helped me beam them. <laughs> what was the other big one right behind the Louisville tornado? Anyway, we've had to, oh, the Yazoo City tornado too, I remember. Um, and the Hattiesburg tornado just last year. Right. So lots of major tornadoes that we've dealt with here in Mississippi. Okay. Yep. So that's your historical perspective that you have to keep in mind. And here's the thing. Those of us who worked in the disability community or who have disabilities that maybe were living here, we know that folks with disabilities were not as well served as the general population. We know it because we were trying to serve them. Without the funds that the government had, without the people <laughs> that the government had, we were out there doing the best we could trying to serve them. We were trying to provide them with durable medical equipment that had been lost in the storm. And we didn't have the money for that. We cleaned out, I can tell you that at the time I worked with Life in Mississippi, we cleaned out our lung closets, cleaned them out. And it wasn't for six or eight weeks until somebody sent us a couple of, a couple of truckloads full, <laughs> full of durable medical equipment to help at home. So one thing I'll say about that is that those of us who were in the service provision community, those of us who provided services to people with disabilities, we got real close real fast. <laughs> Um, because we needed each other's help. I know that Life of Mississippi worked really closely with the ARC of Mississippi, with Department of Rehab Services. If Department of Rehab Services had not given us that big empty warehouse down in Hattiesburg, we wouldn't have had any place to put all that great equipment that had been donated to us. And if they hadn't given us the staff that we needed to deliver it, we wouldn't have been able to take care of it, right? So, so we needed all that. So there's your historical perspective. So those are things we want y'all to remember when you're providing this training, <coughs> is that Mississippi has the environmental perspective to, to talk about, the disability perspective, and the historical perspective that needs to be remembered, okay? Okay, we'll stop any questions at this point. And I should have said, Christina and I discussed it before we started. Y'all don't hesitate to interrupt and ask questions, that'll be just fine. In fact, I wish you would because this is being recorded. So somebody who gets the CD later and is wants to provide the training might go, oh, that's a good question. <laughs> Maybe I'll ask that, okay? Okay, um, oh, shortening the training. As we talked about, it's designed to be 90 minutes. It can be shortened to about 45. Adapting the training. When you get ready to shorten it, you can take out some of the pictures in here, okay? But if you're going to, and we really encourage you to adapt it, you look at this training that you've got. If you know that you're gonna be training an entire room full of people who have spinal cord or brain injuries, feel free to adapt it. Talk to them about the importance of taking extra wheelchair batteries with them or whatever. Talk to them about the importance of having an extra cushion if they need it so that they have something to sit on. If you're training a room full of people who, have, who are blind or have low vision, feel free to adapt this training and talk to them about the specific needs that they may have as a person who is blind or has low vision. Same with the deaf community, people who are deaf, people who, who, have, who are hard of hearing. Feel free to adapt it. One of the biggest problems that we saw after Hurricane Katrina in the shelters was the lack of interpreter services. That's things that that's that's something that a deaf person has got to think about when they're if they're going to evacuate. How do they plan to communicate if there's not an interpreter on site? And chances are there's not going to be for the first three or four days. <coughs> okay. So feel free to adapt and feel free to shorten it, but get the meat of the information in there if you possibly can. Okay. Adaptation. Personalization. We've talked about that. Personalize it to your audience, feel free. If you have questions about how to do that, or if you wanna know if something's okay to do, don't hesitate to call me and 
my contact information is all through here. So call me and ask me. I'm happy to help you with it. Okay. Um, training accessibility and effective communication. As you go through the slides and you're presenting this training, it is highly important that you read everything on the slide. You do not have to read it in a boring, in a boring way, you know. But you have to make sure that people who have low vision or who are blind know what's on the slide, okay? If you have pictures, and there are a lot of pictures in here, describe them, okay? If you are going to be training a group of people who are deaf and, and an interpreter is going to be required, set it up well in advance. Because Ben and I have been talking, we don't have quite enough interpreters in the state of Mississippi. Yes. So, we, you know, you've got to set things like that up well in advance. Make sure that you're providing effective communication. Make sure that everything you do regarding this training is accessible. If you're unsure what needs to be done, call me. If I don't know, I'm going to call Ben or Mike, or Pam, or Augusta, or I'm going to call somebody who knows, okay? And it is okay to ask that in your advertisement of the training, if you don't know the people, it's okay to ask, please call if you need special accommodation, um, you know, as soon as possible, or whatever. Okay. All right, anything else? Oh, yeah. All right, questions and answers. Please. Leave a little time for questions and answers when you're done at the end of the training, okay? Let people ask you, what do I need to do if? What should I do about? Let them ask you that. But be sure and give them a prop, the, the right information. <laughs> Those of us who learn our advocacy skills here in Mississippi under the tutelage of Mark Smith <laughs> know that if somebody asks you a question and you don't know the real, you don't know the right answer, don't answer it. Say, I don't know, but I'll find out, and I'll get back to you. So that's highly important. Don't give people erroneous information, because it's not going to help them if there's a tornado coming, okay? Or if they have to evacuate for some reason. But do you give them an opportunity to ask you questions. You can always give them my uh, email address and my phone number here, and they can call me. Reporting data and feedback, again, we really want to get some feedback on this training. I have to tell you, I'm not sure that, that, that something like this has been done in any other state. There's only three states in the country that even have a Disability Integration Bureau within their emergency management agency. And so I don't know that anybody's ever put together a training like this and then recorded it with interpreters here. Um, and so we really want to know how many people this is reaching. So even if you go and talk to your church group, you know, and there's only three or four people there, let me know. Fill out the form. Again, it's on the flash drive and there's a hard copy in the folder. Fill it out and mail it back to me. Because we really want to know the impact that we're having, okay? Because we want other states to follow our lead in disability integration and emergency management. Because we're proud of what we're doing here. Yes, Chris, the manual says uh, to use the sign-in sheet. Is there a standard one on the flash drive, or do we just create one? Just create one. Okay. There is not a standard one because I was worried that if I created a standard one that has MEMA and the RARE committee and all that stuff on there, that people might not know or understand what it was. And this is, once you've been trained on this, this is yours. So if PTI wants to go out and do this, or if the ARP wants to go out and do it, go out and do it. Now, we hope, you know, it's all over, we're all over the slides, so we didn't feel the need to be all over the sign in sheet. <laughs> so, but, but that's a good question. Thank you. And if for some reason, you know, if you wanted us to create one, we'd be happy to. Just let me know. Anything else? One really good place uh, that likes training is sometimes housing, like Section 8 housing or assisted living housing, because they have a requirement for HUD to provide periodic training. I've done a lot of them at those kind of places, and, and it's very eager off the uh, audience, and they need to know. Right. Okay, any other questions? All right, well, we're going to start with the training, and I'll be honest with you, we can practically skip some of the first slides simply because a lot of that, the, those first slides were the instructions that I've just given you. Okay. So let's just, do you, do you have the clicker? I'm just going to click. Yeah. Okay. All right. Skip? Yeah. Skip this one. I'm sorry, we should 
But I've said all this stuff, shorten it if needed, adapt it to your audience, provide effective communication, leave plenty of time for questions and answers and follow up, and here's your recording data and feedback. Can I make a comment? That very first slide that had the uh, outline of the state of Mississippi on it, theoretically what you should say is this training is disability integration and emergency management, and there is an outline of the state of Mississippi with, you know, should describe that picture because if someone can't see the picture, they don't get part of your message. And in your notebooks, you have the instructor's training. And so you've got our notes underneath each slide. You see that? And if not, it's on your flash drive. So the instructor notes are underneath each slide. Okay? Okay. So this is the beginning, and as Christine said, this is the beginning of the other <coughs> training. Describe the picture. Disability integration and emergency management, are we prepared for the next disaster? Feel free to make that more fun, you know? Hey, have you ever been in a disaster before? Have you ever experienced a tornado? What did you do, you know? Okay, and then the, the picture is, it's the state of Mississippi, it's an outline of the state of Mississippi. In the top left-hand corner is a picture of um, some woods and a house flooded. In the top right hand corner is winter weather, which I forgot to mention earlier, we do get winter weather. And then that, that picture is winter weather with power lines iced over and down on the ground. And then in the middle on the left is the Grand Gulf Nuclear Station smokestack. Uh, and in the middle on the right is a tornado. And just below that is just damage and destruction from a tornado. And then the very bottom picture on the Gulf Coast is a satellite image of Hurricane Katrina as it came ashore. And it covers the entire state of this, the entire <laughs> Gulf Coast of Mississippi. Okay. It feels kind of awkward to do that first, but you do kind of get used to it. And, you know, it's really important that everybody get the same information. Okay. The first two slides are talking about the Office of Disability Integration and we're a division of the Office of Outreach Services at MEMA. We provide day-to-day -day leadership, advice and guidance in all offices of MEMA. So essentially what I do is I'm involved in preparedness, response, recovery, mitigation, training. We're involved in everything here at MEMA. Everything that MEMA does, disability integration has had some say-so in it in the past year and a half, basically. Okay. Ensuring that people with disabilities of all ages are provided equal access and emergency preparedness and management, and that people with disabilities get timely and appropriate services in the event of a disaster. And that we are fully integrated into planning, response, recovery in a disaster. That's, the, that's disability integration in the Office of Outreach Services. Response and Recovery for Everyone is an advisory council created to provide us with advice and guidance, obviously. And um, it's there to ensure that people with disabilities and those with access and functional <coughs> needs are receiving accessible and appropriate services at all times as it relates to emergency management. Um, initially developed for guidance to MEMA, RARE is available to work with any entity on emergency plans. Okay. So bottom line is, if Department of Rehab Services wanted me to come and help them on an emergency plan and I'm not available, I can call a rare committee member <laughs> and ask them to help. You know? Or if, say, Rehab Services wanted me to come over and help them develop their plan, I'm going to bring in response and recovery committee members. I'm going to bring in uh, Sam Glees and Mike and, and Ben and other people to give us a per the whole perspective. Okay, preparing for an emergency, be informed. Know what type of disasters can affect you in this state or in any state. We can be affected by tornadoes, floods, hurricanes, winter weather, earthquakes, fires, chemical spills, and of course terrorist attacks. We can get it all here in Mississippi. That's what it boils down to. We can get it all, okay, and have. Well, not the terrorist attack, but yeah, okay? All right. 
This is a picture of Hurricane Katrina. It's a satellite image and it's a picture of Katrina as it came on shore August 30th of 2005. Am I right? 29th, excuse me, thank you. August 29th of 2005. This is a slide that can be left out if you're in a hurry, okay? This next slide is a couple of pictures of how Katrina affected Gulfport after Hurricane Katrina hit. In the top right hand corner is a couple of guys in a boat in a residential neighborhood rowing, paddling with PVC pipe. Over on the left in the center is a couple of guys walking through debris. It's clearly a couple of houses that are no longer there. It's just rubble. And in the bottom right hand corner again is a street full of debris that clearly nobody can get down because the homes are gone. And people who haven't actually seen this in person may not recognize how powerful the water can be and, and what we saw on the coast. And we encourage you, if you're providing this training and you experienced Hurricane Katrina, talk about your experience. Because the thing is that people listen more when when you have a personal story to share, they pay attention. So if you were living on the Gulf Coast and you were affected by Katrina, share your story with them. This is a good time to do so. Move over a little bit. There you go. Okay, sure. He'll edit that. <laughs> okay. This is the Easter flood of 1979. Were any of y'all living in Jackson besides me in 1979? Okay, yeah, I was too. And uh, what we were doing in the spring of 1979, what I was doing was mucking out friends' homes. In fact, I was the one that was selected to open the drawers and the cabinets in the kitchen and the bedrooms in case there were snakes. Yeah, that's what they did. They were like, hey, you with your hooks, come over here and do that. <laughs> so, and that's what I got to do. So for days, I was in, I was in the neighborhood, and I'm opening drawers and cabinets. And, and, and then here's the thing. It, Northeast Jackson, which is one of the, you know, kind of wealthier parts of the, of the city back then, some folks had hidden their jewelry down in pots and pans in the kitchen cabinets, and they wanted me to get down in there and get it. <laughs> I know it. So this is what I mean about the personal stories. Those are all true, by the way, but I'm just saying that, you know, if you have a personal experience with a disaster that you're talking about, share that personal experience because it engages your audience, okay? All right. Um, this is the Hattiesburg tornado last year. Again, a personal experience, January 21st, 2017. These are, I didn't take all of these pictures, but I did take the two on the top. The top left-hand picture is a lot, a home, a home lot. There's no home, but there's a big pile of rubble, and that is the home. That's what was left. The grandmother who owned the home and her five-year-old grandchild were pulled out from under this rubble with nary a scratch on them. Right? I mean, it was pretty amazing. That wheelchair ramp that you see that's attached to no home, that's her wheelchair ramp. It remained standing. The house is gone. The wheelchair ramp stayed up. And what I, usually, what I told her when I first met her, when I pulled up a few days after the storm and asked to see the homeowner, um, and she approached me, and we talked for a minute. And I said, I need to know the name and phone number of the fellow that built this ramp. <laughs> because it's better than the house. <laughs> the house was gone, the ramp is still standing. Okay, That's what was left of her home was that wheelchair ramp. She used a scooter. She had severe rheumatoid arthritis and she used a scooter. The scooter is somewhere in that pile of rubble. Okay, all right, bottom, um, bottom left is um, the college. William Thank you, William Carey College that was hit so hard by the storm. That's one of the buildings there that might have been a storm on the bottom left. And then on the bottom right, that's a car flipped over in front of a William Carey College. Okay. Again, this, that picture can also be left out if you're in a hurry. Ocean Springs below the Mississippi Bridge after Hurricane Katrina. 
This is a picture of a bridge that is torn up. This is the bridge that spans between Ocean Springs and Biloxi. And the water, the, the force of the water tore this bridge up. So that bridge was out of commission for years. Years? Years. years. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Had to go north of the bay. Mm -hmm. You had to go all the way up to I-10 to get from Biloxi to Ocean Springs and vice versa. This is a picture of a plane flying over a wildfire in Mississippi, dumping, uh, dumping that stuff, the, the, the smoke, the flame stuff. Uh, in 2016, we had 94 wildfires reported in Mississippi, burning more than 8,000 acres. See, we don't hear about that very often, but we can experience drought just like any other state. And when, you, when we're experiencing drought, in fact, even after all the rain that we've received lately, on the pictures that we get every day, on the daily update brief, as it's called, they're still showing some counties that say drought. Even after all, and we're one of them, Hines County, in the middle of the state. So, describe the picture. You've got, uh, <coughs> this is a, um, a work truck, I think probably a county emergency management truck, and there's a plane in the sky overhead that's dumping, uh, the powder stuff that puts out fires. Flame and retardant. I'm, flame retardant, thank you. I don't know the name. Okay, again, this picture can be skipped if you need to. Okay, we get into the meat of the training. Have a plan, y'all. Does anybody in this room currently have an emergency plan in place for themselves? Okay, now see, I'm looking at people who live on the coast and they're like, eh, maybe, eh. Yes, Beth. Good for you. Perfect. Yes. So one of the things that Beth said. Perfect. Okay. So perfect, Beth, thank you. So what Beth has just said is, make sure that your plan is meets your accessibility requirements, okay? Clearly Beth has diabetes and uses insulin. She knows that she's got to keep that insulin cold. So she has a plan in place to do so if she loses power at her house. She can keep her insulin cold. Consider your needs for electricity. If you use a wheelchair or any kind of power mobility, hospital bed, wheelchair, anything like that. Keep it charged up as much as possible at all times and consider a backup, a backup charger. Again, personalize your plan. Assisted, assistive technology devices. If your only means of communication is a communication board, be sure and take that with you <laughs> when you go, otherwise you're not gonna communicate. And make sure that you've got the power you need. Be sure everybody knows your plan. Beth, does anybody else know what your plan is? Yes. Okay. So I have a plan in place at home, and I have a lot of people who know my plan. Christine's plan for, at her home is to come to Jackson to Chrissy's house. <laughs> and everybody knows that plan, right? If there's a tornado in Bovina, my plan is to let Augusta know to take cover. She doesn't respond to me when I, when I send her a text and say, Augusta, duck like I did just the other night <laughs> but there's a plan in place and other people should know your plan because your plan really nobody else knows what your plan is how they gonna know to find how they gonna know where to find you when you're gone and that's a huge problem after an emergency people get pretty panicky y'all remember after Hurricane Katrina how we were communicating with other people down on the Gulf Coast because our 601 and our 228 numbers would not work. Well, I can tell you that for Terry Redding, for instance, who worked for Life of Mississippi in the Biloxi office at that time, we communicated with her by talking to her mother in New York, New York, or, New York or, yeah. So I could use my phone to call her mom out of state, and her mom could then call back into the state and talk to Terry. But the two state numbers could not communicate with each other. So that's how we knew that Terry needed some hearing aid batteries, Get cash. 
ATMs aren't working. If there's no power, there's no ATM. If you don't have a little extra cash on hand, you know, emergency cash. Y'all, most of y'all are probably from the South. How many of you know that your mama used to keep that $100 bill or even a 20 or 10 tucked away, folded up in the back of the wallet? It's her emergency stash. You need to do the same thing. Okay. Well, and the thing to think about here, to emphasize here, is that it's really important to have a personal plan. There is no way that you can go somewhere and expect anyone, MEMA or FEMA or anyone, to meet all of your personal disability related needs. Now they'll try later on, you know, after the fact, but for the first few days, you need to plan for yourself. A lot of people think it'll just appear out of nowhere, but think of all the medicines there are in this world and everybody takes different things. So you need, you know, three days of your medicine and that kind of thing. That's just really, really important. They say that the, 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 what we say in the emergency management community is the first 72 are on you. First 72 hours of a disaster are on you. Be able to take meet your own needs, if at all possible, the first 72 hours. Pam. A couple of things that I've known people to do. If they switched medications, they kept a little bit back of the old one if they still had it. Um, I'm not recommending that you ever skip a dose, but if it's not a life and death, you know, like if it's a high blood pressure pill, you might, you know, missing one may not be so bad. You could skip one and, and, ke and, and keep two or three. Miss one now and then. What, now and then, yeah, not all at once. That's my, I forget, <laughs> but, you know, I do have usually yeah. a few more. Not right. No, yeah. not if it's a life and death medication. Absolutely not. Don't skip it. And you what should you really do, talk to your doctor about right. that because they should be willing talk to provide. Talk to your doctor. Yes. Uh, okay, hang on. Yeah, go ahead. Yes. Perfect. That's a great idea. Beth? Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I would dare say that if you live on the Gulf Coast and you use Walgreens or something and there's a hurricane in the Gulf, that if you went to Walgreens and said, look, I'm going to be out of my medicine in about three days and I'm going to be evacuating, can you go ahead and fill it? They'd probably do it. Yeah, okay. Use a, use a, a chain, chain, a drugstore yeah. chain. Mm -hmm. Good idea, yeah. Shella, did, did, did you have, or Ashley? I was going to say the same thing about the sample. Good. Great suggestions. Keep those in mind when you're providing this training to a group of people that you can make those same suggestions to them, okay? And we do embellish and add to this as we get suggestions from the people that we train because right. people have ideas. Because I'm going to remember that. Shella? Uh, I would suggest always remember um, if you get to the point where you're in the middle of a disaster mm -hmm. and you're getting your medicine from someone like Walmart, where they are a chain drug store. Mm -hmm. That's right. And that's a good thing to remember, particularly if you're in the service provider field, that often Medicaid and Medicare will lift their restrictions on purchasing in the event of a natural disaster exactly. like that. Exactly. So if you have lost your wheelchair or your cushion or something like that, if you can show proof. When I first started here on contract in 2016, we had the flooding in the Delta. and. One of the things that I figured out real quick was when somebody told me they had lost a piece of equipment, a lift chair, for instance, she didn't have any documentation that she ever had it because FEMA says, get all that muddy, wet stuff out of your house, you know? So she did, and then the garbage came too quick. There was no proof that she ever had one. But being from Mississippi and having worked in the service provider field, I knew which medical supply stores I could call and see if I could find her 
and find the and sure enough, it was A and A out of Greenwood <laughs> had given her that lift chair, and they had it on record, and were able to order her a new one through Medicare. Yeah, so things like that, Alan. One thing I found too, because I was out of town and ran out of my Medicare. And here's this room full of people and what we're doing here today. You, you guys have been in this field a long time, so y'all have great suggestions. Y'all remember some of this stuff because when you're out there training groups of people with disabilities, you're not going to win any of this. So remember that and keep it in mind. Create a support network. Your plan doesn't do any good if nobody else knows what it is and it goes awry, okay, if it goes wrong. You need a support network. How will you contact family members? If Mississippi is affected by the winter storm and all the power lines are down, is there not somebody over in Alabama that's not affected that need, they need to know what your plan is so that, or that you need to contact them, okay? You may not be able to talk to people in the state. Have an out-of-town contact person. Let people know what your plan is. That's highly important. Be sure those who are helping you understand your equipment. Okay? So, Desmond, you can explain, right? Cindy, you can explain how your equipment works if you needed to to a first responder or somebody doing search and rescue. Understand your own equipment. I know how my prosthesis comes on and off. Not many people could figure it out if they didn't wear one. Write it down. Right. So Cindy, what Cindy's saying is that she has everything written down, how her equipment works, and all that stuff. She keeps it in a pouch so that if she's unconscious, they will they can find it and will know what to do. Beth. Mm -hmm. Right, and that's all going to be on on this. That's all coming. Y'all, y'all are getting ahead of me. Well, that's, that's good. Know that's what's the good. go they kit? Know what they're doing. That's right. And another thing that we stress is that even if you think you're going to remember exactly what it is, you might not if there's a disaster and everybody's upset. So you need to write it down, and you need to have it in a Ziploc bag. So if your go bag gets wet. Right. Your ink doesn't spread. Right, right. Okay. Should you stay or should you go? Decide ahead of time if you need to evacuate. There's going to be different circumstances. But if you plan to evacuate, how do you plan to evacuate? Okay. Now, when Hurricane Katrina came through, a lot more people should have evacuated. When Hurricane Nate came through this past October, <coughs> It was a Category 1 storm, and I don't know, I know very few people who actually evacuated. If you live on the Gulf Coast, you're pretty savvy about understanding when it's time to go and when it's okay to stay. But have a plan in place for evacuation or for sheltering in place. You need to have more than one plan. It's not yeah. a, just a one plan exactly. thing. Exactly. It's going to be dependent on the situation. <clears throat> no different routes, because let's face it. If there's a bad enough storm and there's trees down on 49, how else are you going north? Or should maybe you go east or west instead? Okay? Leave early. Don't get stuck in traffic. If you're a person with a disability and you don't need to sit in one location for eight or ten hours at a time, leave early because chances are you're going to. Y'all saw Houston. The last time, not this past time, that, that when the Houston flooded this back in August, the mayor did not declare a mandatory evacuation because the last time he declared a mandatory evacuation, people sat in their cars on the interstates in Houston for 24 hours, stuck. Yes, ma'am.
Make sure your gas tank is full. Absolutely. Since I started working for MEMA, I never let my gas tank get below half a tank. <laughs> I'm kind of obsessive about it. Yeah. If you're going to shelter in place, make sure you have what you need to shelter in place and be comfortable and meet your needs for three or four days because nobody may be able to get to you, okay? You've got to have what you need. If you're staying home or sheltering in place, have your needs. Have your supplies. Protect your property as much as you can. Hurricane shutters, boarding up your windows and doors, etc. If you're going to a disaster shelter, know where those shelters are and have your kit ready to go with you to get to the shelter. If you're wondering whether or not a shelter is accessible in your area, we have not had an opportunity to review them all, but if you'll call me, we'll go look. Or guess what? Y'all are all pretty savvy. Go look yourself. You know? If you're wondering where the shelters are in your area, call me. I can tell you. We have a shelter board on our computer system here, and there's 400 shelters in the locations are listed. And the contact person. So if you're a person with a disability and you want to know where the local shelter is and if it's accessible to you, you call me. I'll give you the information. And then what we call blue skies when there's no a major disaster like I wouldn't want you to call the county emergency manager today for Tunica County because he's a little busy right but call him when there's not much else going on and say I'd really like to see if this place is accessible to me because I'm a wheelchair user can you open it up and let me take a look take that responsibility yourself okay yes ma'am That's the next slide. <laughs> we do have that. Yeah. I should have known that this group would get ahead of me. Yeah. Well, it's not the next slide, but it's, it's coming up. This slide can be left out, I believe. This, slide, this is a picture of the evacuation routes from the Gulf Coast. Where do you go? Know where you're going. I think you can leave this slide out if you're, if you're in a hurry, OK? And they also, the Mississippi Department of Transportation has some little maps that they have available. Mm -hmm. So probably. It's on the flash drive, in fact. Oh, uh, we it? have the hurricane evacuation map on your flash drive. And you probably MDOT. could contact them if you hold a training mm -hmm. and you wanted to provide that to everybody. You, they probably would give you a mm -hmm. bunch of them. Yep. Okay, again, how are you going to go? Are you taking your own car? If so, do you have gas in it? Are you going with a family member or a friend? If you're depending on someone else, does their vehicle meet your needs? Cindy's not going to call me to come get her in my Chevy Impala. Neither is Desmian, right? Okay. Is there room for your equipment and the supplies that are needed? This is a question to ask both family or friends that you're riding with as well as any public transportation. During Hurricane Nate, we had an elderly couple who wanted to evacuate their home and go to the closest shelter. Gulf Coast Transit will provide that transportation for them and did, but they had some restrictions. He can bring his personal equipment, you know, his wheelchair, his walker, whatever, and they can each have one bag or maybe two bags plus a medical bag, okay? So there's going to be some restrictions. Know what those restrictions are, if any. Public transportation, do you have a reservation? Sometimes you don't need one if it's an emergency. Gulf Coast Transit, for instance, they prefer that you might call ahead and say, hey, I might decide to be evacuated, but they'll go get you anyway until the wind starts blowing at a certain rate, and then they're going to stop. Okay? And it's a good idea to have a backup for that. Right. Because there were several instances in Katrina where people thought they had reservations, thought they had a plan, and then nobody came. What can you take with you? Understand what you can take with you. What are your restrictions? If you do not drive or have a personal vehicle, you must arrange your own transportation to get out. Don't depend on first responders to rescue you. They may not know you're there, number one, and if they do know you're there, they may not be able to get to you. And trust me, y'all, the first responders are busy enough if they don't have to come get you, don't make them, okay? 
go. Okay. Well, and there comes a certain point of wind that they don't allow them to get out. Right. So, you know, you just right. have to think ahead. I think that it's when the wind gets to 30 miles an hour. I'm looking at Carlos. Is it, do you know the answer to that, Carlos? Okay. Sure. Oh. Uh, okay. Okay. All right. All right. Then they start closing bridges, yeah. and then you can't get anywhere. That's right. Collect your contact information. If something, if my house got hit by a tornado tonight and I'm knocked out and they're, I'm found under the rubble, I want them to be able to, you know, find, see something on me, my phone or something in a pouch or something that says who they need to call. So they'll know to call my mama <laughs> or call my brother, right? Same thing. Keep a list of family and friends with you. Even if you think you'll remember it, write it down. Or keep it in your phone, but then for heaven's sakes, keep the phone charged up. This is also something good to send to someone out of state. Exactly. 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 My sister lives in Birmingham. She has all of this information with her, too. Okay. Keep a list of organizations that can help you. If you are deaf and you go to a shelter and there's not an interpreter and you're unable to communicate, who can you call? Department of Rehab Services? Counselors, Office on Deafness and Hard of Hearing. Maybe you have Danae or Amy's personal cell phone numbers. <laughs> who can you call? Keep a list with you of people who can help you if needed. Your phone numbers for your doctors, your pharmacists, and your medical facilities that you use. That should be a part of your list. Because if something happens to you and you're in a shelter, or you're taken to a hospital that they're unfamiliar with you, if they see that they can call this doctor or this other medical facility and get the information that they need on a person with a disability, they can do that, okay? Copies of prescriptions and doctor's orders for assistive devices. A lot of times, people with disabilities are getting their assistive devices purchased through the Department of Rehab Services or through a Medicaid waiver or something like that. Okay, fine. And you're providing your prescriptions to them, to your case manager, to get it purchased. Tr keep a copy of it if at all possible. But if not, at least know where it came from. I can't tell you the number of times that a person with a disability will say, well, who bought the chair? Well, Ms. Shella bought it. Well, where did it come from? Well, I don't know. Well, if I don't know where it came from, I can't talk to them about getting it replaced. Or if I don't know your case manager's name, I can't call them and talk to them. And during, um, right after the storm in Hattiesburg, the tornado, uh, two days later, I was out with uh, a Linda Ponder who works at Rehab Services, I mean at Human Services, and she and I got a phone call. We had just left a big church and we got a phone call immediately from the pastor, and he said, would you go over and check out this residence? There's two family members there with disabilities. Sure. We were right around the corner. So we go over there. We pull up. We park. I go walking up the driveway to this home, and there sits two people, both of them in wheelchairs. And just because of my own experience with, with wheelchair users and different types of disabilities, I could tell immediately he was in a uh, Medicare purchased uh, jazzy snazzy wheelchair that you can get on TV, <laughs> you know, which told me he probably could walk some. She, however, was in a customized power wheelchair and she clearly had a spinal cord injury around the C4 or 5 level, you know, and I, and I just, I, I knew these things just because I've been in the business. A lot of people won't. But she was, able, Amanda was able to tell me who her case manager was, what her needs were, and I was able to call the case manager with the Department of Rehab Services and say, she needs some more supplies pretty quick. She needs her catheters, and she needs this and this and this, because all of that stuff had gotten wet. Yes? That's right. Shell about that. Yeah. Right. Right. Even if their counselor goes through state medicated Medicare, 
mm -hmm. right. right. And so when you're teaching this training to groups of people, say, who family members of people who have a cognitive disability, for instance, most of the time what they'll say to you is, well, I get my services through mental health. Well, who might that be, you know? And is it a Medicaid waiver or is it a, you know, what is it? What, are you served at a facility, for instance, or in your home? Are you getting home attendant care services or are you getting respite services? These are things that often the family members even and the caregivers don't know exactly. So it's vitally important that they have this information on the person that they are responsible for. You know? and, and these wheelchairs are prescription items. Mm -hmm. It's not mm -hmm. something you buy off the shelf, mm -hmm. you know, so you have to kind of know the mm -hmm. criteria, yeah. the details. Your pharmacy will give you a list of your prescriptions. So get a list of your prescriptions. It'll have the name of the medication, the milligrams, and the dose. You can keep that with you. Okay? All right. Additional things to consider. Medical insurance cards, Medicare, Medicaid. You may not want to keep your, um, the original in your wallet in case the wallet is stolen or something, but you can make copies of it. Just keep up with it, okay? But you should have copies of that stuff if you need it. Keep them in a dry safe in a Ziploc bag. Medical information. Your doctor's name, allergies you might have. Uh, if you have a peanut aller allergy, you need to have that written down somewhere. If you're allergic to shrimp, somebody needs to know that. And okay? if you have a medical alert bracelet or necklace, you need to be wearing it. Always. If you're on dialysis, what's your plan? Our staff person who lives down on the coast that worked for Life of Mississippi, who was on dialysis at the time of Hurricane Katrina, he had evacuated actually to Miami, I think. Miami? Is that right, Bobby? Yeah. He had evacuated to Miami, I think, where his family was. Well, he couldn't come back for, oh, I don't even know, six months, eight months, because the dialysis centers on the coast were gone. And he couldn't go. And the, only, the first one to reopen was in Mobile, and needless to say, it was really full. So he couldn't even come back for a while. So if you're on dialysis, what's your plan? Have you talked to your provider? Because, y'all, they may can suggest to you, listen, if you live on the Gulf Coast and there's a hurricane coming, we're going to transfer our records or, we're, or we have a, a memorandum of understanding with this provider up in Jackson. Go there. Okay? That might help you decide... Well, where am I going to evacuate to? Am I going east, west, or up to Jackson? Okay? And I don't know if dialysis centers do that or not. I'm just saying it's a good idea to check and see. Okay. Easier to find out when you're not mm -hmm. in the middle of an emergency. Yep. Okay. Next slide. Service animals and pets. <laughs> I told y'all I was getting to it. <laughs> what supplies do you need for your service animal? or your pet. Your service animal, as everybody in this room for the most part should know, your service animal can go with you anywhere you go. Any shelter you go to, your service animal can go with you. It should be welcome. If it is not, if you ever get to a shelter and you were told you can't bring this animal in with you, I hope the first person you call is me. Seriously. And I'll give you my personal cell phone number. Because we've had this conversation so many times with the Red Cross and other uh, shelter operators that it should no longer ever be an issue. Okay? So, service your service animal is welcome wherever you are. But you can't expect the shelter to have dog food, a leash, medication for the dog, et cetera, et cetera. You've got to take that yourself. Just like you have to put the first 72 is on you, it goes for your pet too. Okay, or your service animal. And remember, your service animal will be able to be with you in the shelter, but a lot of the shelters now have areas for animals that are just your pets. Mm -hmm. And so one thing you might want to check out beforehand is which shelters have a close-by pet place. Um, there's one of the schools that's a shelter that had planned to use the band room as a place to put the pets, and they had the little... Uh, cages for the instruments mm -hmm. 
they thought that would be perfect. So you want to select a shelter that meets your needs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So again, if you're wondering where the shelters are and if it's pet friendly or not, you can call us, we can tell you. It's on the shelter board, I think. Isn't the pet friendly shelters on our shelter board? I thought so, okay. All right, so take the leash, your vaccination records, um, food, uh, thank you, treats, medications, blanket or pet bed, and identification. What? Water. Okay, water. Yeah, that's the other thing. When you're packing your go kit, it's a gallon. <laughs> it's a gallon of water per person per day for three days. Add, add, add a gallon for your dog or your pet, okay? If you have a pet or a service animal. Okay. Leslie, do you? Okay. All right. Okay. I'm sorry. Say that again, Cindy. Oh. Okay. She, Cindy said service animals are used to air conditioning and they'll get overheated faster than the average pet. Okay. Good to know. Thank you. All right. Personal care services. Do you use personal care assistance or other services to live independently? I live independently in my own home. I don't necessarily need personal care services, but I know a lot of people who do. If you do, especially if it's coming through a service agency like the Department of Rehab Services or the Department of Mental Health or one of the Medicaid waivers, work with your case manager or home health agency to develop a plan, okay? If you're getting attendant care services and those services are coming through a waiver program, you need to let your case manager know what your plan is. If there's a hurricane coming, by the way, Ms. Shella, I'm packing up and going to my mama's house over in Alabama, okay? Okay. So okay. Perfect. So it includes all of that, including meditation, the address to 911, the electric company, the gas company, uh, and <laughs> the with every day. She don't yep. know that. Okay. If you're a doctor, okay. Um, I assume mental health, Randy does the same. Cool. Okay. And I think also. The also there sometimes you need to be sure you kind of have a backup idea because once in a while things don't work out just exactly as you think they're going to and so having some other ideas there is a good idea too and this goes back to you need to be able to discuss your disability with other people and if you feel like you cannot then you need to write it down if a, if a person who has a cognitive disability that normally can communicate just fine with their with their everyday attendant that they have gets separated from that person and ends up in a location where they don't know anybody if they are not able to explain to the nurse on staff at the shelter what their needs are then it should be written down so that the nurse can see it and get it because it could happen that they are separated from their from their typical caregivers okay well and that applies to people with all kinds of disabilities some of us spend our life trying to seem less disabled than we are, and it's just very hard sometimes to put that right out there. Right. So, But it, you have to if you want your needs met. Right. It's a good idea to write something down. Mm -hmm. Discuss options with your caregiver and check with Meals on Wheels or any other service you might get out there. If you're getting Meals on Wheels and they come to your house five days a week with lunch, let them know, hey, by the way, if there's a hurricane in the Gulf or something like that, I'm leaving. Okay. Right. Or I'm I'm sheltering I'm in staying. place. Are you going to be providing mm -hmm. these services and on what mm -hmm. basis? And if not, and there's a hurricane out there, can I have a couple extra? Yeah, <laughs> give me a couple ahead or something. Okay. All right. Your disability. We've touched on this. You need to be ready to discuss your own personal disability-related needs. If this is a problem, write it down. Put it on paper and keep it with you. As Cindy said, she keeps it in a pouch on her or uh, in her backpack or somewhere. Okay. Be open and honest. And that's not always easy, as Christine said. It's not always easy to discuss our, our disability, you know. It's not always easy to discuss our abilities or our limitations. But if you want to be well served in that shelter, 
you need to be able to discuss it, okay? Or if you end up in a hospital, that hospital staff needs to know, look, I'm paralyzed from the waist down and I can, I can have a skin breakdown real easy. So please turn me every two hours, okay? We have to take that personal responsibility for ourselves so that other people will know how to help us, okay? All right. Get your go kit ready. We've talked about this. How many of you have a go kit? I have two. Okay. That's not very many, y'all. Okay, if y'all are going to provide this training and do instructor training to Pam's got one, I know. Pam's, okay. Pam's got a good one. I want, I want you to be able to say to the group you're training, hey, how many of you have, a, have, a, have an emergency go kit? So that you, and then you can go, I do. Do you? Okay, get a go kit. I will say also, if you're providing training, uh, the Life Office has few times gotten uh, people to donate, like Walmart or somebody to donate, so we could actually provide everybody with a, the beginnings of a go kit. And sometimes that's a nice way to start off if you can get that for your training. And I will tell you that I'm planning with the help of the coalition, can I say this, Pam? Okay, with the help of the Coalition for Citizens with Disabilities, we are planning to purchase some very small, they're like $5.50 $5 go kits that we can give to some people. We're not going to have enough to give every single person you guys ever train out there, but we'll have some to get, at least to kind of get started, okay? Beth? That's right. Yep, keep your pill bottle and put, that's right. So we're going to get some of those little go kits with Pam's help. This is really so good because it's being recorded and you guys are asking, you know, I didn't think about the particular audience today. I just wanted to train y'all so you could go out and train other people. But because of your history and because of your knowledge and because of your expertise, you're asking, as Lee said, PhD level questions, which is good because they're getting captured on the on the recording, you know, so which which is great. So, okay. All right, before we yes, ma'am. Maybe you're going to train a group of folks. Uh-huh. So you're training a group of um, vision impaired of blind people. Yes. How would you download, how would you take the CD and make a, a group? You have, well, the CD, when we finish recording this, that's a good question because the reason we're putting this recording on CD is because the flash drive is not quite big enough to hold it. And so it's got to be on that CD or DVD. And you'll have a copy of that because I'm going to mail it to you. And from this point forward, after it's done, a copy of it will go into the notebook. So the only thing I can suggest at this point is they can either contact me directly or you can contact me and I can mail them a copy of it or you could let them borrow it and download it onto their computer at home. Does that help? Does that answer your question? Or Ray obviously has a... And if I may yeah. add something, um, I won't edit this part out. We'll put it on our YouTube page. Oh, okay. Um, there you so go. If you guys <laughs> go to our FEMA YouTube page, you can have your own DVD. That's fine. But if you ever in a pinch, bring it up and we'll have the interpreter yeah. up, Christian, and it'll okay. all be there. So you can utilize the slides, the DVD, this video, whatever you need to get your point across. So if you're training and you're not necessarily very comfortable with training yourself and you'd prefer, if you have internet access and can get to our YouTube page and a screen and projector, you could just show this video, this training, right? Does that answer your question? Does it? Okay. Okay. Right. In the laptop. Uh -huh. Mm-hmm. You could. Um, that, yeah. And that's got audio. I was say, what about, when you say you're mailing them, what about emailing it so that you can email it to whoever, you know, if you have a vision impaired person. I can do that, I guess, depending on the size. I mean, yeah, as people yeah. are capable of receiving on, uh, receiving, receiving a file that large, I don't know. I mean, I think I could, yeah. Yeah, or email a link so that we can talk right. to Email, email the link. Email. Exactly. I could do that. We could it's email the be, link. It's going to be a huge file, Christian. So that's yeah. what I say. If you, if you utilize our YouTube page, we can just literally send the link to any mm -hmm. and everyone that wants it. 
That would be the best thing then, the YouTube link. Okay. Will it be captioned? Yeah. Yes. Well, and, and we have the interpreters. Yeah. So. Everything that you guys see here right now, that's the way it will go. You'll see the three ladies at the front. Every now and then you'll see the projected screen. But if you look at it, you'll have your slides and a PowerPoint form. You'll also have this to accompany it. Okay. Other questions? Okay. Good. All right. Okay, so let's move on then. Let's talk about the kit. We were saying earlier, we are gonna hopefully get a few smaller kits that we can provide to y'all. Like if you call me and say, Christy, I'm training you know, 20 people uh, in two or three weeks, can I have a few of those kits? And I'll see, you know, we'll see what we can do. We're not gonna have a whole lot. We'll probably start with a couple hundred, but our hope is that we can generate uh, a grant, another grant or some more funding to purchase some more. And it's just a starter. What, can we go back to the kit for a second, please? Thanks. So in your kit, we've talked about this. You need a gallon of water per person per day for three days. You need a three-day supply of non-perishable food, battery-powered or a hand crank radio or a NOAA weather radio, a flashlight and batteries, a first aid kit, a whistle to signal for help, a dusk mask, towelettes and garbage bags. Thank you, sir. Maps and comfort items. Okay, personalize this kit to meet your needs or the needs of your consumers that you're working with. Comfort items. If you are the caregiver for a child who has a cognitive or a developmental disability, and, and they get upset easily or something, and you're in a shelter, trust me y'all, shelters are chaotic. It is loud, it's noisy, and it's chaos. Perhaps a weighted blanket, a favorite stuffed animal, a favorite toy, something like that. Take that with you. Personal fans, if you get overheated fast. Something, that's something to remember about the service animals, if they get overheated fast, take a, take a small personal fan with you and then blankets. Anything personal that's gonna make someone more comfortable, okay? Okay. And you also need to do this in a way that's manageable for you. If I was alone, I would not be able to manage three gallons of water and take them anywhere. But I might be able to put some smaller bottles of water in a bag and make a couple trips. So you've gotta think about your ability. You know, if somebody was with me, then they could probably do the gallon, but I couldn't. A lot of people use a backpack to start their emergency kit, but it's not necessary. If it's easier to use a duffel bag or something like that, or even a suitcase, that's okay too. Rubbermaid. Or a Rubbermaid container, that's right. The picture Pam has on a Rubbermaid. It was, <laughs> it was good. <laughs> the picture on the screen is a backpack, and then outside of the backpack is all the different things that we've talked about, water and food and things like that. So, that yeah, learned, Leslie? Something that we learned. Go ahead. I was just gonna say, something that we learned was to have Benadryl. So make sure that first aid kit has Benadryl. You can save yourself a lot of money, and also you can save your life because uh, things are gonna be biting you, like spiders, that you may not know that you're allergic to. Okay, I Benadryl. Really, I had a really big vet bill because of that. Oh, okay. <laughs> good thought. Okay, thank you. Benadryl. Leslie, did you have a question or comment? I was just thinking about the, the pillows in the comfort kit for storage purposes, though, the Ziploc storage bags that you can take the air out of with the yeah. vacuum cleaner mm -hmm. yeah. just for practical storage yes. purposes. It makes it a lot easier to carry. That Great idea. Yeah. Great idea. See these PhD level suggestions that you're <laughs> telling me? Awesome. Okay, Kelly. Thanks. Personalize it. We've already talked about this. What durable medical equipment do you need? You know, if you end up in a shelter, the Red Cross may be able to provide you with a catheter kit in a couple of days, but they're probably not gonna have it when you arrive. And it might not be what you're used to. Right, take your own assistive devices, food for special diets. They will eventually get any kind of special food that you might need. They can eventually get it, but it's gonna take a while. Prescriptions diabetic supplies, hearing aids and batteries. 
first thing Terry Redding requested when we finally got her on the phone four days after the storm, please bring me some hearing aid batteries when you come. And let me tell you, my grandson gave me this. This is my favorite assistive device of the day. You cannot believe how many things I can do. That's a back silly. scratcher. I know, uh, but it, I can do a million things with it. You Christine know, just pulled out a telescoping back scratcher from her backpack Okay. From my grandson, you know, he had the good idea. Okay. Cool. All right. Okay. Manual wheelchair if you have one. Just in case the power goes out and you don't have access to charge up your batteries. All right. Insurance coverage. Those of you who live alone or live independently, you should know what your insurance coverage is. You should know who your um, insurance agent is and how to reach them. That information should be on all of your information. Have your policy information available. Know who to contact in case of damage. And take photos. Y'all, this is so important. Especially if you have a disability. Take pictures of your DME, of your durable medical equipment. Take pictures of your hearing aid. Take pictures of the batteries. Take pictures of things that you know you'll have to possibly replace. Because if you don't have a picture, no, it serves the number of purposes. One, you can possibly get the, the um, number off of it, the manufacturer's number off of it. That would help. Two, you have proof that you owned it, you know, okay? Um, three, if it's lost or damaged, then you have a photo. You can take a photo of the damage afterwards. So you have a photo of the good wheelchair that wasn't damaged and a photo of what got flooded, okay? And take pictures of everything because a week later when everything's had three and a half feet of water on it, you don't remember what you even That's had. Right. I suggest, and this is what I did, all of our, everybody has a cell phone now and most cell phones have a decent enough camera and video recorder. Walk through your house, start at the back door, the front door and walk through your house and record. This is my big 55 inch screen TV. You know, oh, that, look, this is my spare wheelchair that I need sometime. Mm -hmm. Here's my, here's my refrigerator that has my diabetes medicine in. <laughs> you know, take pictures, take a video of things like that. Okay, because none of us, when was the last time you left home without your cell phone on purpose? See, yeah, okay. All right, take photos. Download apps. Download apps to your cell phone. Weather Channel will send you alerts. Local stations will send you alerts, weather alerts. The MEMA app will tell you, the MEMA app is great. The MEMA app, not only does it have weather, but it also will tell you who your county, it has a list of the county <laughs> emergency managers and their phone numbers. It has um, all of the, um, social media information that's going out. So it has all the tweets that MEMA has sent out. It has their Facebook posts that they've put up. All of that stuff. It's a great app to have. I recommend that everybody have that. Code Red. Most of these apps, and I think that there are some particular apps that have been designed for uh, the deaf. Mm -hmm. Most of these apps, however, you can do, set it up to either have a visual alert or a noise alert, a, a hearing alert. So, yeah, Mike? Uh, one thing that's changing, uh, when I was with Baptist last week, they encouraged me uh, to download the My Chart apps. So, all my medical history is there. Oh, wow. Okay, that's a good idea. Thank you. You've got to do three hours of paperwork. <laughs> it's a great app. Yeah. Okay. Great. My chart. Probably okay. Some of the other hospitals may be doing the same or already okay. doing. Okay. Okay. Of course, General and Hattiesburg Clinic uses Iris. Yeah. Which is the same thing. Uh, Iris. Mm -hmm. It coordinates Iris. all of your uh, doctors, your appointments, your prescriptions. Yeah. Um, it, great. And everything's updated like immediately at your appointment. Great. It's not uh, a time lapse of having to wait for stuff to update after there's been medicine changes or physical therapy suggestions or whatever. It's all on there immediately. Okay. 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 Yeah. All the time anyway. That's uh, yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yeah, I know it. We all could use that, right? Okay. Yeah, and Shella? Oh, I wanted to um, bring up a point about the pictures that, that, that you thought about. Uh -huh. um, the point that you was making about making sure you take pictures of the home and whatever, yeah. uh, drip medical equipment. Uh, I was thinking along the lines of what happens if you actually lose the phone itself right. with the pictures on it. Yeah, I usually, myself, with my cell phone, if I take pictures that I feel I need to keep uh, and need to be, you know, just in case I don't have my phone, I usually email the pictures to myself mm -hmm. or I would uh, email it to the Facebook yeah. or send them to my personal email. So I would have a second place those pictures are Great. a place yeah. just in case the phone get out of hand or get, get away from it. Perfect idea. A lot of people now store their pictures and media and stuff like that in, in the cloud or on Dropbox or right. something like that. Absolutely. Great idea because you can access that from anywhere as long as you can get to the internet. Amen. Yeah. Perfect. Also, I think there is an app that helps you. You can take a picture of each of your medicine bottles that records the yeah. what it is and the dose and all that. Also, um, when you were talking about the insurance, the mortgage, you need to have the 1 800 number because they, if you get behind on the paying it, if the you know the mailings and all that, you could end up having all these extra fees and all that. Okay, good idea. Okay, keep all that. All right, keep your cell phone charged. You can take chargers, y'all. You can buy them. Uh, Stacy brought me one not long ago uh, for she got it for five bucks. Mm -hmm. Keep it, keep that charged up, and it'll keep your phone charged up if you run out of juice. With, if you have ceasefire, yeah. They, when they, people trade in their phones for new phones, yeah. they don't send the chargers back. They just send the phone, and they have drawers and drawers full. So uh, a lot of times, ceasefire will just give you one if they have one that'll fit your phone. Great. Something to remember. Ceasefire. <laughs> Local. Okay. All right. Most of y'all know me, and we've said this so many times before, the best thing you can do for yourself as a person with a disability, particularly, is to get involved. If the community doesn't know that you're there, they can't help you. If the local fire station doesn't know that you're out there, they can't help you. If the local county emergency manager doesn't realize that there's this many people in his county that have a disability or this particular kind of disability that might need this particular kind of help, he can't help you. There are lots of ways that we can get involved as the disability community. And when you're providing this training to people with disabilities or their family members and caregivers, we really want you to emphasize the importance of people being their own advocate and becoming actively involved in their communities. You've got to let the fire stations know you're there, the police stations, the county emergency managers. There are long-term emergency planning committees out there. There are community-based recovery centers uh, and committees out there that are involved in long-term recovery efforts. They have to hear from the disability community in order to understand what our needs are, right? So that you've got to get involved in that way. Beth? Well, y'all are here in Pearl, and the majority of the people that are my neighbors in my streets and around my area are elderly and disabled. So I think that y'all should be pretty aware of that. Right. Already. Yes. You work here. Right. Well, and I tell you, for years and years, I've lived on the coast for uh, since I was 10, most of the time. I uh, never would have gone to a shelter because I knew I couldn't go to the bathroom at a shelter and I'm not going to put myself in that position of not being able to go to the bathroom. But now, thanks to several of my good friends and the commitment of MEMA, I know that there are places that I could actually choose to shelter where I could go to the bathroom and as a bonus, plug in my chair. <laughs> so it would be an option for me now. Right. You know, it would never have been an option before. So. I don't have to tell y'all this, you already know it. We have a lot to offer in terms of time and talent and energy and knowledge and expertise. We need to start sharing it with people. I can't, I can't teach everybody in the state of Mississippi the importance of emergency preparedness for folks with disabilities. I can't even do it with, with, with three or four people helping me. I gotta have all y'all, you know? We've got to all get involved in this if we're going to save lives, and that's really what it boils down to. Um, 
Justin Dart, as most of you know, have heard of Justin Dart. He was the father of the Americans with Disabilities Act. He has a quote that says, get involved as if your life's depended on it, because it does. Okay, well, some people attribute that to just get involved as if your life depended on it, because it does. Some people said that the, the quote was, vote as if your life depended on it, because it does. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. the bottom line is, get involved, vote, serve on these long-term recovery committees, serve on your health care coalition in your area, serve on <coughs> any emergency planning uh, group that might be available. And if you want to know what's in your community, call us, we'll, we'll find it uh, and let you know. Kelly and I can find it and let you know. Get involved as if your life depended on it, because it does. This emergency management and disasters are life and death. <laughs> I've had a disability most of my life, and uh, I believe that the majority of people would do the right thing if they knew what the right thing was, but honestly, some people just don't understand enough about disability to, to make the right choice. Right. Some people are ornery, you know, there's going to be ornery ones out there, right. but most people, if they know, uh, want to help and want to help. And you know, if you live in a rural part of the state, and this is going to be really important when y'all are out there training other people and providing this training, Mississippi is largely rural, obviously. So what we depend upon is our, uh, our volunteer fire stations, right? Our, our sheriff's department. Often they know their community very well, and they know who's in the community that may have a disability or is elderly and would need some assistance. But if you've moved into a new place, you're not sure they know you exist, go tell them. Go to the store and buy some cookies or bake some cookies and go let them know that you're there and, 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 and what your address is and that in the event of an emergency, you may need some assistance. Two years ago, when I first started and we were doing the flooding up in the Delta, I went to go look at um, uh, uh, a, uh, a, an old fire station that they were going to use as a disaster recovery center. And in talking to the county emergency manager for that county, I asked him, I said, were there very many people in the county with disabilities that needed help? And he said to me, yeah, I went and picked up Miss, Miss, uh, Miss Joe's uh, wheelchair and Miss Long's wheelchair, and I got them stored in here so they wouldn't get wet because the water got, was coming into their house. And their kids took them, you know, and evacuated them to their home or something. But I got the wheelchair so they wouldn't get wet, you know, or whatever. So, okay. So get involved. All right. Okay. All right. Next slide, Kelly. Okay. How? We've talked about this. There are local community resources available. Visit your local first responders. Let them know you're there. I promise y'all it helps because Daryl and I used to take dinner to the fire station around the corner from our house. Uh, often, and most of you know Daryl was my late husband. When he first got sick, the few times that we had to call 911 to get an ambulance over there, I'm here to tell you that fire department, man, they were there in about one minute because they knew who we were and they knew where we were. So, find out who your county emergency manager is. It's on the MEMA app. <laughs> it's also on the MEMA website. MSEMA.org or download the MSEMA app. To your cell phone. Volunteer your time. If you're curious to know how you can volunteer and when you're talking to people in the community, please encourage them. We, in the event of a major disaster, we can't do it all by ourselves. I, we need more people who are knowledgeable about the disability community to help us. We are recruiting people with disabilities and family members and service providers of people with disabilities to serve as disaster reservists with us after a disaster. And that's, that's volunteer work, but it's actually paid volunteer work. It's $23 an hour in the event that we call you up and need your help, okay? Consider being a reservist and serve on local task forces and emergency planning committees. People need to be able to put a face with an issue. All right, this slide actually could be left out. This is a strategic plan that the Response and Recovery for Everyone Committee developed, and we just wanted y'all to be aware of it. It's very simple. We need to find people. We need to get people out. 
Number three is you got to house people both long term and short term, short term and then long term. And you got to return individuals back into their communities and into their own homes and communities. What we saw after Katrina and what we are continuing to see now with the 2017 hurricane season <coughs> is that people with disabilities who had to leave hadn't hunt, come home yet. And if you want to know more about that, call me. I'll send you the little short story I wrote called A Two-Year Journey Home about Christine and how it took her two years <laughs> to get back to Ocean Springs after Hurricane Katrina. Well, two years. Also, the little blue sticker on the exterior of the temporary housing does not mean it's successful. Yeah. <laughs> Just because that is that wheelchair sticker. symbol, that's right. Keep that in mind, that's right. All right, this is a list of general resources that you can look up. This, I think, is also on the jump drive. MSDMA.org, be prepared. That's, our, that's the um, Disability Integration Bureau's page on the MEMA website. MSEMA.org training slash disaster reservists. That's how you would go in and sign up to be a disaster reservist. And it is very interesting. Extremely interesting. We're going to train you well. Kelly, you want to say anything else about that real quick? I would like everybody to sign up for sure. <laughs> and <laughs> because, like she said, um, there's so much that y'all can contribute and we really would like to have. Yeah. Disasterstrategies.org is, is another good site. They have a blog. That's the Partnership for <laughs> Inclusive Disaster Strategies, which is new. FEMA.gov and their media library, they have a ton of stuff on there. We put a couple of documents on the jump drive that's in your, in your notebook, a couple. We didn't put a whole lot, but there's um, a disaster plan, there's um, some personal uh, checklists that you can use and that kind of thing. Um, basic preparedness from FEMA and then ready.gov. Those are all good websites to go to. To go back to the disaster reserves, Christy. Yeah. If y'all need help after you sign up, I'm always here to help. Don't worry about the classes or anything. If you feel, you know, the classes are a hindrance, ask Christy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, we can help. You know, we let her do it our own, but we could have helped her. <laughs> yeah, they could have helped me. But we can help. Yeah. Um, right. so. Also, right. this particular page here, you know, people like to leave a training with something in their hand. And at least this page right here, it's a great thing to copy for everybody so they can do that. And it's in your folder, so you can just make a copy of this one page if you didn't want to make a copy of the entire training. And the ready.get up kit. Yeah. That is the perfect place to go, and you download it, put all your information in, and then stick it in your kit. Right. Because that's every bit of information you need. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You ready? Yes, ma'am. Connect with me on social media. Mima has Facebook. That's how I get the word out often to y'all about impending weather. Um, Mima's putting it on their Facebook page. I then put it on mine. I can put it on Life's uh, group page. If it's a page and not like a group forum, like Coalitions is a page, for instance, I can, I can tag Pam. Um, Disability Rights in Mississippi, I can put it on there, but somebody has to approve it, but they always do really, really quickly, like within just an hour or something. Um, but I, what I do is I put it on Facebook and then I tag certain people. Um, I've tagged, uh, you know, and, and so what I haven't done that I need to do better and start getting that onto Facebook pages of some of the state government um, agencies. And so like Department of Rehab Services, maybe if mental health has a, has a Facebook page, that's a good way to get the word out. And what I'm doing is taking what FEMA puts out there. Sometimes I get a jump on, on MEMA actually. I get a jump on them and I'll put something out there myself if I have a graphic that I can use. Um, Twitter, you can follow Twitter. Uh, Mima on Twitter, you can also follow me. I have a Twitter account and the only reason I use it is for emergencies. So if you follow me, you're not going to see a bunch of, you know, puppy pictures of mine or anything like that. It's only emergencies. Um, and then Snapchat, at MS, at, at MS Emergency Management, and then YouTube, as Ray said earlier, was talking about that we have a YouTube channel, videos that are on the YouTube channel, they are captioned, 
by YouTube, Ray does a fabulous job of checking it though to make sure it's correct because often YouTube doesn't get it correct. <laughs> so they don't understand what's being said, but anyway, Ray checks it to make sure so YouTube. And then this is my contact information. It's in your notebook. Feel free to give it out to people. Um, my office number and my cell number on here and my address and my email address. You can call me with any kind of question. You can call me if you need assistance uh, to deliver the training. You can call me if you need something in particular. Okay, Pam? So this is unrelated to this. Okay. <laughs> well, sort of, but so YouTube will caption a video? Yes, you YouTube. You can put it on there and, th yeah. and then, like you said, I know you Yeah, have but you have to really watch it because I think they're not great. I'm looking at my interpreters. And Ben, I think that YouTube is not really, uh, they're not perfect, and sometimes they have the words no, wrong. they're not perfect, that's correct. They're not perfect. You really have to be vigilant and watch what they're typing. So. They don't understand. Because so it's an automatic um, captioning system that they're using. So sometimes their translation is a little bit odd. Usually I think that if you're providing this training out there, it's going to take you about 90 minutes. And again, you can shorten it if you need to. Uh, just please help us. Now you have this notebook. If there's something in there that you don't have that you want, let me know because that helps me for the future. Once the CD has been created and edited, we will send you a copy of that to put inside the notebook, but we also will do a YouTube link eventually and get that out there to you and let you know about that. You, once you've been through this class, and we really ask that you come through this class before you go out there and train groups of people with disabilities. So we prefer that you come through this class before you do this. So I'd appreciate it if you didn't just like hand your notebook to somebody and say, here, you can go train. I want them to have received this training first, okay, from, from, from us. Our plan at this point is for Christine and I to do this training in several areas of the state between now and the end of the 2018 year. This is our first one. My plan is to do three or four more. We were hoping to train about 50 people statewide in the first year. I got 30 of you right here, <laughs> you know, so that's good. Um, but now that you've been through this and you've got the binder and stuff, feel free to take it and train groups of people with disabilities in your local area. I would love to see, and I'd love to kind of get a commitment from some of the service provider agencies in here that you'll, that, you know, that you will do this, that perhaps the ARC of Mississippi will share it with their chapters and Life of Mississippi will, will use it in their peer support groups or something like that in their agent, in their local areas and same for PTI and the coalition to just, you know, to use it. And all I'm mainly asking for is you don't have to tell me every time you're gonna do it, but I sure would love to get a copy of that form so that we can keep up with it, so that so that we can then go and brag to Mr. Smithsonian that <laughs> <laughs> about, about, you know, about the good things that we're doing and how many people that we're able to reach out there in the community. And that's the, here's the most important thing that I want everybody to leave here today with, and that is, People with disabilities for far too long have been underserved in this area, and we have died because of it. We have seen people die. We have watched people who we knew and loved die. No more. And the only way we're gonna prevent that is to train them so that they understand the importance of being prepared for a disaster themselves. So, Thank you for being our inaugural class <laughs> and for having such fabulous questions and all that. Um, Mr. Smithson, Mr. Smithsonian Smithson, he did bring some uh, Mima for Kids books uh, in here. There's a stack of them back there. So take a few with you and take a look at them. Scooter the Squirrel, for those of you who are curious, we're working with a um, company now to, about developing Scooter. Scooter is probably going to be a squirrel that's a wheelchair user and may very well, may, may very well also have a hearing aid <laughs> or some, you know, and glasses. Who knows? 
<laughs> but it's a developing it's a developing yes. character, that's right. So if you get more wanted, to come. If you all have like organizational conferences and you would want us to train a group of people at a conference, we could do that. Absolutely. Yeah. Pam. So so just just so I'm clear, the what we went through here is a train the trainer. And yes. You guys are gonna be doing all the train the trainers. We're yes. just gonna be delivering the trainer to I mean the training mm -hmm. to that's right. People yeah. with disabilities or Yes, but now, if you are feel really confident in your abilities to do a train the trainer and you want to eventually do that, you know, do one or two, Christine and I will come with you to do one or two, and then once you feel like you're comfortable doing it, we're like, unleash you, go, you know, you know what I'm saying? I mean, we're, this is not proprietary is what I'm trying to say. It's just that I think that the information is so important um, that we prefer people get this instruction before they, you know, have a problem. right? Exactly, exactly. So, and a lot of times yeah. you're just going to get really tiny groups, but even the tiny group, that's important too. Mm -hmm. You know. Mm -hmm. Mike, did you have a question? Well, I was going to say, you know, uh, before getting involved with Rarity, to me, this I would have not even thought about it to be prepared. Mm -hmm. so, and yet, Mike, there's a creek that's just just right around the corner from your house. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if we did, my house is in Okay. or to find a location where they, they, they would be relatively comfortable. Perhaps they would have been a little bit more willing to go when they needed to go. Right, so that it's right. Not, it, you know, it doesn't become a trauma on top of a... Exactly. exactly. And we have the, the people, the many, many people in Mississippi that identify as being people with disabilities, but we have that elderly population, and they're not going to say, I'm a person with a disability, right. but they're added into the people with right. unique functional needs. Right. Okay, Kelly was reminding me, if, um, we had a sign-in sheet, and the, the main reason, I want everybody to sign it for sure, but I really want your mailing address so that when the CD gets ready, we can send that to you so you can put it in your binder. Okay. Did everybody sign in? If you didn't, let Kelly know. Okay. All right. I cannot thank y'all enough for your time and listening to us today, and I hope those of you who have already heard this training like twice already because you were helping us develop it, Thank you for coming and uh, listening to it again. <laughs> so.